why the Commodore 64 mostly uses joystick port 2. This is all theory, so there is no actual examples remaining that we know of, so it's impossible to be sure or confirm. However, it seems fairly solid that the Commodore 64 started life as an enhanced VIC-20. Whether it was the VIC-30, the VIC-40, the other VIC-40, we don't know. It stands to reason, though at some point, what becomes the 64 had two VIA chips on its board, just as the VIC-20 does. If we look at the VIC-20 motherboard and the C64 motherboard, we can see the top left has the same layout. Two interface adapters and the same keyboard connector, as the C64 uses the same keyboard as the VIC-20. We also have the same user port, same tape port, same disk port, and same video port. The CIA, complex interface adapter, is basically a drop-in replacement for the VIA, the versatile interface adapter. It has extra features and crucially a bug fix in the shift register which would allow the C64 to have faster disk loading. Sadly this didn't work out and we had to wait to the C128 to get it. Although the C64 is 100% capable of doing it. Now a lot of the pins are the same. The voltage rails, the register select lines, the reset line, the data line, the fire clock, the read write, the IRQ pin, and crucially to this quest, port A and port B pins are in the same order. However, there is something odd in the chip's registers. Note that the VIA has register 0 as port B and register 1 as port A. The odd thing is the ports are 100% arbitrary and there is no reason why you couldn't just take a rubber and rub the A and B out and swap them. This is kind of what they did on the CIA. Note that register 0 is now port A and register 1 is now port B, which makes more sense. However, they kept the pins A and B the same, so rather than just swap the names, they also had to swap the internal pin layout. The C64 motherboard connects port 1 to port B and port 2 to port A, which sounds like madness. However, if we have VIAs, which is my hypothesis, that means control port 1 would be on memory address DCOO and control port 2 would be on DC01, which in a roundabout way makes sense. But then during development, somebody says, why don't we use these new CIA chips? It has a bug fix, more features, and we can get faster disk loading. Somebody looks at the pin out and the board dev team see the pins match up and they just add in the new lines and drop them in. To swap the controller ports over would probably be a massive board rework. Port A is still port A on the pins, so nothing to do, right? Now, you could just swap the names of the ports as written on the case. So 2 is up front and 1 is at the back. But marketing may not have liked that idea. See the video of Bill Hurd talking about how they changed it's the 16 on the plus 4 from control port 0 and 1 to 1 and 2. Given the first 64 had text printed on a metal plate, it wouldn't have been hard to do or expensive to do. But this has another knock-on effect. A keyboard. The way the C64 and VIC-20 reach the keyboard, as they are the same keyboard, is by scanning an 8x8 grid. First you set all the port lines to high, then set one to low, and check to see if anything on the perpendicular line is low. Best way to think of electricity is like water. So imagine that each of these lines are canals, and when we pull them high, we pour in a lot of water, so the water level rises. But each canal has a small trickle of water being added to it, so if nothing is driving it, it slowly fills up to high. Now to change the state, we drain the line, i.e. make the water level low. Draining is easier than filling. Now on the Commodore 64, 
kernel puts a value out on port B and checks for the corresponding value on port A, which sounds backwards. However, the keyboard scanning code is the same as the VIC-20s, which had VIAs, so on the VIC-20 the code puts a value out on port A and reads from port B, which makes sense. So here, since the X is depressed, PA2 goes low. Now, on the C64, the joysticks are attached to the same CIA as the keyboard. On the VIC-20, it was attached to the other VIA, the same as the user port, so the joystick worked the same way as it does on the PET. Joysticks don't need to read a value from the CIA first, they just connect a line to ground, i.e. drain the line. So if the C64 is scanning the keyboard, and you have a joystick position held, say up, we now have a condition where the CIA is trying to fill the line to get it high, and the joystick is draining the line. The CIA is not very good at filling, and the ground is the best at draining, so the CIA loses. This has two problems. One, the CIA is going to keep trying to fill the line with more and more electrons, more than it is designed to. This wears it out, and thus slowly damages the CIA. Second problem is, the CIA can't tell the difference between the first and last columns. So while it thinks it's scanning the last column, if you have a key in the first row depressed, it will read the key as being pressed in all of the columns. So if you use Joyport 2, this issue is mostly avoided, as the keyboard scan routine uses port B. So you only get a fight when you have a key depressed while you are holding a joystick direction or fire. Also, we don't need to swap port B from output to input and then back again if we want to use the kernel keyboard scanning routine, making it easier and safer to use. However, if you don't need to use the keyboard, you can just as easily use port 1, which is what some OCD computer programmers sadly did. So you get the, oh, this game needs Joy 1 problem.